Thank you, Mark. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, a few things that Mark said that weren't quite right. First of all, sorry, Mark. I, I'm not going to lecture very much. I, I do that for a living. Um, and, um, but instead, I'm going to ask you to work to help me as a scientist. I'm really interested in, in these new, fairly new efforts called the citizen science programs. And, and probably many of you are, participate in that, the Audubon Christmas bird counts. And, and there are others there for butterflies and for fish and for water quality. They're happening all over the world. And, and it's this getting people engaged in the process of science. Most of those are at the data collection level. Um, and, and I think that's great. You know, people are out getting stream invertebrates and, and, and identifying them to, to family and sending them in and get, taking water samples. And, but tonight, what I want to do um, is get you to engage in um, another part of the scientific process. Uh, and that's the more synthetic phase. And, and I frankly need some help with this. Um, because it gets really complicated, as you'll see, uh, when there's so many players, and you have a handout, I hope you can see one, um, if you don't have one in your hands, um, which has the list of players, and so many processes involved in, this, in these changes that we're seeing right here. Um, these changes are, are slow and steady, and sometimes not so slow, um, sometimes very abrupt, um, and I want to try and capture some, I want, I want you to try and capture some of that. And then I'm hoping that um, some of you stumble on a way of portraying in a conceptual model or a systems model the transitions that I'll introduce between coastal forests, the coastal hammocks that you're all familiar with, and salt marsh. And, and, I, and I'm going to restrict this um, as much as I can to kind of natural processes rather. I don't want to introduce dredges and seawalls and, um, and beach replenishment and all that kind of stuff. I'm interested in the, in the natural processes and their interactions. Both those that serve to maintain an ecosystem like a coastal hammock um, or a salt marsh and those that cause the transitions between them. And, um, so what I'm hoping is that you will you know, get out a writing implement and use the back of this page to, um, to draw a model portraying the transition between coastal forest and salt marsh. And, and my, my vision of this is a two-box model that's connected with arrows, and in the boxes are the players and the interactions among the players, and, and, and I'm not sure how to do this. I, I, I frankly have never done it to my satisfaction, and, and what I'm hoping is that um, in this group with so much experience um, in different fields, some in science, some in real estate, some in banking, um, some teachers, some musicians, and, and all choreographers, I have high hopes for the choreographers in the group, um, who'll be able to put this together in some way that captures the dynamism. That's what I'm hoping for. And then um, you have my email address, and um, you can give me your paper if you think you've stumbled onto something, or you can scan it and, and send it to me, and then I'll use that. And I, and, and, you know, for self-grandizement, I won't I won't mention your name, of course. I'll take full credit for your work. No, I won't. No, we can collaborate on this if you, uh, if you come up with something that... Um, but all of us should leave with a better sense of how to capture complex interactions and processes and, and, and these that we can see right out the door here. So um, I, this scientific process in which we're engaged... Is, is just wonderful. I mean, I remember the scientific method, learning it in middle school. I think I fell asleep right at the um, methods. Uh, I was never good at science, and I, I don't know what that means anymore, because science is just this wonderful creative process. No, a lot of it's boring, you know, a lot of repetitive, getting your sample sizes up, but there, there, 
it's tremendously creative to think about complex phenomena. And it's no different than, than law or business. You're also having to hold lots of things together and look at the interactions and, and you have non-linearities. It's not a non-additivity. Um, this kind of science really does benefit from a diversity of perspectives because we're in that synthetic phase. I'm going to supply you, and there are other experts in the audience and soils and, um, and, and physiology and so forth that can help with that if we need it, um, but the conceptual challenge is one that I hope you find accessible. I want to start this with just a, a little story. Um, and, and the story started back in the early 90s. I was sitting in my office at the University of Florida, and I got a telephone call from a distraught... Um, uh, plastic surgeon who had a summer house over in Yankee Town, or I didn't know where Yankee Town was at the time, I had to look it up on the map while we were talking on the phone, and his palm trees were dying. And, and I, one of the things I work on is palm, palm ecology, and, and the idea that they'd be dying. Remember, lethal yellowing killed a lot of palms in South Florida, and I was really worried about something like that. So I followed up with a group from the University of Florida and we went over to see what was going on, thinking that the palms had a disease. And sure enough, they did. You know, here are fungal bracts on the side of a cabbage palm tree. Yeah, the trees were sick. Um, and oh my goodness, this is worrisome. This is a state tree of Florida and South Carolina, for that matter. But um, you were really important in, for wildlife and for landscaping in every way possible. But then, um, thanks to the Division of Forestry, we went up over the coast in a helicopter and um, found, saw quickly that, wow, this phenomenon of the palms dying was really restricted to a fairly narrow band along the coast. And it wasn't just palms. That um, what you're seeing there is dead palms and sick palms that are, that are a little chlorotic, a little yellow. The, the leaves are quite small compared to the big leaves of a healthy palm. Um, but a lot of the skeletons of trees are, are red cedar trees. So now if you're looking at your score sheet, you've checked off um, cabbage palm and, and red cedar, southern red cedar. The, the matrix, that what you see under that, the light brown, um, is salt marsh with um, species that I'll introduce in a minute. So what we're seeing here is this dynamism of forest being replaced by salt marsh. And at that time, we, we didn't know exactly what was going on, but we suspected that it had something to do with, with sea level rise. And here we are um, with salt marsh shrubs in the understory. Um, like in this case, um, this is mostly Iva, um, which is one of the common, uh, um, marsh elder, I think is the most common, common name. Another common name for it is Jesuit's bark. Anyone has a clue about that? Because Jesuit's bark, to me, is cinchona, which you use to cure malaria. It comes from the mountains in, in Peru. Why Jesuit's bark for this? I don't know. But in any event, here, that's a salt marsh shrub that's growing in the understory of dead and dying cabbage palms and very dead um, red cedar or pencil cedar. This is the cedar after which Cedar Key is named. And the work I'll be talking about is um, based on, on the West Coast, just south of Cedar Key in, in Wakasasa Bay State Preserve and, and the most wonderful privately run um, nature reserve, of which I'm aware, is called the Withlacoochee Gulf Preserve. And it's run by a community association, of the community of Yankee Town, and it's a glorious place to go. And if anyone wants to see the effects of sea level rise, it's the place to go. I mean, it, but it's really pretty as well. So, to get at what was going on, um, we, in a group of, um, who, nobody's here so I won't recognize them by name, all group of researchers, graduate students and undergraduates and faculty set up a, a, a series of permanent sample plots um, in which all the trees are marked, mapped and measured. We didn't have any drones or sonic devices. I'm a really a 19th century kind of scientist. I'm really good with uh, rulers and diameter tapes um, I'm fast, I'm accurate, um, and you know, people come into my lab at the University of Florida and they're desperate to find some digital piece of equipment. So I got a microwave, hey, there we go. <laughs> and I, know how, I only know how to use quick start on it, so. 
um, this work was fun because, you know, working in salt marshes and, and coastal forests is just glorious. And this area, the Big Bend area of Florida, is one of the, is the most undeveloped coastline in the lower 48 states. You know, it goes from north of Tampa all the way around to Tallahassee. There's hardly anyone living there. So there hasn't been a lot of freshwater um, uh, removal from the aquifer. So we're not getting that problem. There's not a lot of development. There's some logging, there are hunt camps and so forth. Um, and, you know, we'd go out for long weekends and weeks at a time um, establishing these permanent plots. And we were trying to get at growth rates of, of trees and, and, and palms. Well, for a tree, you can put a diameter tape around it and you can get the diameter increment. It doesn't work for palms because they don't grow in diameter. They don't have a vascular cambium. They're as big as they are ever going to be. So to get growth rates, we... Um, used my tree bicycle um, and climbed up and marked the youngest leaf and then we could monitor leaf production. Um, that's not something you need to know, but it was just so fun. The tree bicycle is a great, um, is a great machine that I understand. And so, I don't know why I'm slipping data in here, but um, here we are with, this is a list of species that you probably can't read from the back of the room, but it's a long list of species. And this is a gradient of elevation um, from, from the highest elevation, which was at a um, dizzying height of, of nearly a foot and a half um, down to sea level. Um, when you get close to sea level, all that's left is, is cabbage palm. Um, all these other species have disappeared. So that's the background. Um, we knew that was when we did laser levels and, and measured the elevations, we had this, um, but then we did it over time and made use of historical um, air photos like these, where we're taking the, the picture, or the picture was taken um, in, in 40, 1944, 1974. Notice that this was one big island, became two small islands by 1999. Um, there were still some stumps in between, um, but now we have two islands where there was one. So, pretty evident from historical air photos and from the ground as well. Um, the palms were indeed dying, but they were the last trees to die. Um, it seemed like the palms held on um, a little bit longer than the red cedars, and the uh, live oaks went out just a couple years before the the red cedars, and then you go down the line of those species of the sugarberry, the Celtis levigata, the sacred trees of the Celtic people, um, um, didn't put up very much well at all with any um, soil salinity. So, I'm not showing you a whole lot of data, um, but we could use our, our, our surveys of topography um, the data that we had from NOAA on, on tides and um, predict, um, changes, changes in sea level to, to project how much um, coastal forest was going to give rise to um, salt marsh. Um, and so both the greens here are areas, the dark green and the light green, where um, we had... Um, <clears throat> In, in 2000, we had forest, and by 2100, at given current rates of change, um, that was all going to be, um, give rise to salt marsh. Now, there's nothing wrong with salt marsh. Um, I like salt marsh, um, and I like coastal forests, but so I'm not, I'm not putting a value judgment on this. It's just a process that we're trying to, trying to understand. And by doing this monitoring and measuring sea level and measuring soil salinities, and then in a really ingenious series of, of um, reciprocal transplant studies where we took seedlings at the same elevation in Wakasasa Bay where there's no spring, transplanted them to Chazowitzka, which has a first magnitude spring, we could separate the effects of, um, of water, sea level, from the effects of, of salt that comes in with that water when, when the land is flooded. Um, and the background driver in this is this um, <coughs> rate of sea level rise. You notice that the 
signal to noise ratio, this being the signal and that being the noise, is, is pretty severe. Um, you know, there's some years where mean levels of the sea are high and, and some years low, and it has to do with influxes of water because this area is, um, the salinity is very much influenced by proximity to the Suwannee River, um, bringing in huge quantities of fresh water, and then these first magnitude springs, Homosassa and Chazowitzka um, in particular. So um, the salinities aren't very high, Sea level is affected by winds and, and, and other factors. And, and curiously enough, when you look at sea level rise, in, and here's Cedar Key, um, this is slightly different, oh, sorry, slightly different data set, but the, um, the rate of sea level rise in Cedar Key, um, which is actually now higher than, than 1.5 millimeters per year, um, that's 1.5 centimeters per decade. Doesn't seem like very much, um, but when you're only this far above sea level, it's a lot. Um, and there are other processes going on. Um, when sea level rises, sea surges that come with storms, um, the, their effects move or, or extend much further inland um, as a, uh, in, reacts, in response to sea level. And if you know, if the storm comes by at high tide, then you're really toast. And I think you saw some of that um, fairly recently. Sorry to say. And, and the, <coughs> the rates of sea level rise, measured rise relative to the land, vary tremendously. The, the global average is, is about three millimeters. Um, but you can see that in some places the sea level rise is lower than the global average. In some places, it's substantially higher, but that has more to do with land subsidence, um, which is associated with pumping of gas and water and so forth, and compaction of the soils. And um, The area where we're working around Cedar Key is on a limestone platform, so there's no subsidence. I mentioned before that there's not a lot of freshwater withdrawal from the aquifer, so that's not the issue. Why the rate of sea level rise around Cedar Key is lower than it is globally is a, still a mystery to me, and, and none of the experts have been able to explain it, but um, it's still going up. And this phenomenon of sea level rise um, is of particular importance to us here in Florida, which among its other traits, flatness and lowness of elevation is, is quite characteristic. So we're not anywhere in Florida, we're not very far above sea level. And huge areas of the coast are, are pretty darn close to current sea level and are, and are getting submerged. I'm not going to be showing you projections of sea level rise and so forth, because I want to get at this process of, of transition. Um, but yeah, and, and this isn't new news, right? Sea level's been rising for the last 14,000 years. No, you know, that's, so it, it's accelerated, but it's been fast before. And, and one of the things to keep in mind is that Florida, um, we think of Florida as ending here. I'm working up in this big bend area here. We think of Florida as ending right at the pier in Cedar Key, but Florida actually goes out quite a bit further. I mean, if you, um, 10,000 years ago, if you tried to drive from Gainesville to, um, to the coast, you know, to go scalloping or something, it was a lot longer drive. And I don't expect that the roads were any good either, so it was a long way. And um, there are Paleo-Indian villages that are out there, and, and, and you can find them if, if you want, because um, you look for uh, circles of fishing boats, because there's springs out there, and I don't know anything about fish, but fishermen do, and apparently where that fresh water comes up, um, the interface between the fresh and the salt water is a good place for some kinds of fish. Um, and and the, the archaeologists are out there with scuba tanks. Um, I, I mentioned that the rate of sea level rise is accelerating, but um, I, I want to avoid hyperbole. It's not unprecedented, you know, the rate of sea level rise that we're, we're seeing now. It's important to um, keep in mind that there have been times in the past, um, <coughs> here we are 14,000 years ago, when the ice was uh, melting off of Chicago um, and sea levels were rising. 
um, that the rate of sea level rise was much faster than our measly three millimeters per year um, today. And, and one of the remarkable things is that people came here, the first people walked over the, from the Bering Islands, um, the continent of Beringia, which is now underwater, from Asia and, and arrived here about 20 minutes later in, in some 14,000 years ago. And, and they um, built villages on the coast. Those, some of those villages got inundated so quickly that the stones in the fire, the fire circles, didn't get moved around. At the rate of sea level rise we have today, um, there's a lot of movement of coastal sediments by, by meandering um, tidal creeks and so forth. But um, when the sea level is rising this fast or this fast, um, nothing gets reshuffled. So people have adapted to this before. Um, so, um, you know, here are some of those rates. Um, Ten times higher than what we're seeing today. <coughs> so there's a lot going on, and I'm not a climatologist, um, and, um, but we need to keep this in the back of our minds. So if sea level has risen before, and it's done this several times over the last two million years, then why are we so concerned? Well, um, you know, in not too long, the archaeologists of the future are going to be looking at our um, coastal systems um, with scuba tanks on. And sea levels over, um, over the last 500 million years have mostly been higher than they are now. I mean, the last two million years, we picked a really bad time to inhabit this planet, um, if you don't like winter, because, you know, winters have really gotten bad in the, only in the Pleistocene in the last two million years. Most of the rest of the history of the planet um, was warmer, higher atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations, um, the polar ice caps are pretty new, glaciers are new. Um, well, we're doing everything we can to get rid of them and to get the, um, the carbon dioxide concentration of the atmosphere back, is back to what it's been most of the time. The problem, though, obviously, <laughs> is that a lot of us live along the coast and a lot of us live in, in low-lying areas. So, as I said, I don't want to talk about responses, um, demographic or engineering responses to sea level rise. I, just, I want to get at these processes that, um, that are going on in natural ecosystems, just as a foundation. And then, if you want to, and I hope we all should be doing this, go on and project what kind of adaptation and mitigation actions we can take um, to deal with this. So, I want to think about these coastal forest, I'll call them coastal hammocks. Um, they start out as upland freshwater systems, sometimes what's called a hydric hammock that has upwards of 25 different tree species in the canopy, sometimes slash pine flatwoods with um, oaks and pines and so forth. Really lovely um, ecosystems, but I like salt marshes as well. Um, I'm going to go through the players now. So maybe you want to look at the, that the sheet I handed out, because you're going to start working soon. Um, and if you don't have one, maybe shift around so you can see one. Um, or maybe you know these species already. And cabbage palm is the, um, is the most familiar. Um, with each of them, I'm going to say something about its ecology so you can start using this information and you're thinking about your models. So um, it's a long-lived tree um, based on our studies out in on the Gulf Coast. Um, a, a cabbage palm of this size is probably 150 or 200 years old. So those cabbage palms you see in the back of trucks being taken out of the coastal swamps and transplanted into parking lots, you know, they're 150, 200 years old. Um, because a palm goes through a period of establishment growth during which it's building a trunk, doesn't have a trunk above ground that can last out in the woods 30 to 40 years. So you add 30 to 40 years, and then you count how many leaves are produced per year, and then you count how many leaf scars there are when you go down, and when you finish with that work, and I told you science is sometimes boring, um, then you come up with a, a very large number. So these, these palms are old. Um, the fruits of cabbage palms um, are 
really important for wildlife. It's a, it's a droop, a single seed, um, fed on by anyone who eats fruits. Um, the, um, but also, there's a beetle that lives inside these, um, these fruits. I have the name there, Caryobrucus or something. Um, it's a, a species specialist, so it lives inside the seeds. And um, <coughs> the beetle oviposits on the fruits, but also can oviposit, can lay, the female lays her eggs on the seeds. But the seeds are also, the fruits are eaten by frugivores, animals that pass the seeds through um, and sometimes kill the beetle that's there, the beetle larvae. Um, but then when in the feces of the bears and the raccoons that eat the cabbage palms, the, um, the beetles find that, the, those piles of seeds very easily because they go up um, scent trails towards the feces. They smell, they smell the bear poo and they find the seeds that way. So if you, I mean, you come to these lectures hoping to learn something, and here it comes. Did you, did you ever eat too many dates? And you know what happens? Well, it turns out that the same thing happens to bears and raccoons. And, and so when they have diarrhea, the seeds come out and get washed very easily and they're isolated and fewer beetles find them. So um, I once, one of my favorite articles ever was a, um, it was entitled On Diarrhea and, and it was a single run-on sentence that ended in a semicolon in which I described this phenomenon. It was kind of a joke, but it's a true phenomenon. I mean, we had data to support it, but you got to have fun in this job. Okay, so then we have this interaction between bears and raccoons and, and beetles um, and the gastric effects of eating too many palm fruits. Um, no right. And then the other, another big player out there is, is red cedar, southern red cedar. Um, there was a, a pencil factory in Cedar Key, how it's got its name. No, I'm sorry, I misspoke. There was a pencil slat factory. It was German. Eberhard Faber owned the company. But we couldn't figure out how to make the pencils. I mean, so they, the company in Cedar Key only made the pencil slats. You know, how do you get the lead inside? So then we'd ship the pencil slats to Germany and they'd put the, the, the lead inside. That all then turned the last century... Uh, hurricanes and so forth, and ran out of cedar. So there's been a lot of cedar harvesting for, um, for pencil slats. Um, like all gymnosperms or um, cone-bearing plants um, with fleshy cones, this is a cone, like a pine cone or a cypress cone, um, these trees are dioecious, so they have separate males and females, um, and these are bird-dispersed and raccoon-dispersed, and I don't know too much about the fates of their seeds, but they're, they're beautiful trees. And in the forests of, of cabbage palms and, and red cedar and oaks and, and, and sugar berries and um, all these other tree species, there's a whole suite of wildlife. I'm only going to talk about a little bit. I'm really a botanist, right? So I'm going to mostly talk about plants, but um, you know, gopher tortoises are there, and you know, we see them. They're a, a component of these ecosystems, important for their burrowing. Um, they, too, eat juniper berries and cabbage palm fruits and plums and, and um, cacti and, and a whole diversity of things. But these are not found in, in salt marsh. Um, so the, the burrow of a, a gopher tortoise is a couple meters deep and five meters long, and, and they get submerged, and... Um, that, that's it for the, for the gopher tortoises. There are screech owls that are really abundant. <coughs> I don't know how abundant they are here, but over on the west coast, there are lots of screech owls. And they seem to like the dead palms, and they use them um, for uh, nesting cavity trees. And, and so there may be a boom in screech owls populations, which are cavity nesters are often cavity limited. So um, they may be a beneficiary of the death of all these palms. Okay, so moving downhill, 
you know, your ears are popping, we're going down, we've just dropped, you know, this far. Um, and, and we get into the zone of, 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 of salt marsh shrubs. And one of the, um, the common ones is marsh elder. Um, I think they're still in flower now, probably, um, out around here. They flower long and late. It's not a very showy flower. Member of the, um, uh, the sunflower family. Um, wind dispersed seeds and, and pretty hardy shrub. My favorite out there is, is this one, the Christmas berry or wolf berry. I like wolf berry. Um, the fruits are edible. It's in the tomato family. They make little, um, little tomatoes um, and beautiful flowers. And this is a late flowering thing, but it's a salt marsh shrub, tolerant of pretty high salinities. And it comes in under the cabbage palms and, and red cedar as they're going out. So I want you to capture this in, 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 your, in your models. Um, the seeds are dispersed by birds and, and mammals. Um, and I found this picture of a raccoon. I just think that's so, I mean, I, sorry, I like, still like raccoons. Um, but their raccoons, as you know, are um, upland and lowland species. They're, they're quite capable of moving out through the salt marsh. They, their diet out there switches from um, <coughs> grubs to crabs and clams and so forth. And um, so raccoon is one of these important dispersal agents um, and, and an indicator of the upland, um, co uh, upland salt marsh uh, interface. The dominant player in the salt marsh is, is the black needle rush. Um, you know, the forms these gigantic clones. Um, black needle rush uh, is a species that spreads vegetatively, as do a lot of them out there. So this might be, this might be one genetic individual from one seed. And I, um, this is one of the species that might need some assistance to keep up with sea level rise. They call it assisted migration. And you'd think that a species this common would be able to keep up with um, migration. And certainly sea level has risen before, so why is it going to have trouble this time? Well, I think its reproduction by seed is cued by fire. Um, that this is a, a fire fruiting species. And we're not burning the salt marshes or allowing them to burn very much. And that may be a problem for them. Another really common one that gets more common as you go further north is, is the um, cordgrass, the salt marsh cordgrass, Bartina, um, Alterniflora. We have it tall and short. It, it, it tends to be um, replaced by black needle rush, except maybe if there's fire um, or a lot of herbivory, because um, Spartina is pretty tasty. Um, <coughs> <clears throat> and marsh rabbits like chewing on, on Spartina. We, we did reciprocal transplant experiments between black needle rush and Spartina, um, but the rabbits chewed the Spartina down because they like the black needle rush as a habitat because the owls can't get them. Um, diving into black needle rush is not a good idea. Um, and, um, but they don't eat black needle rush, they eat, they eat the Spartina. Um, and they swim to get away. This is just a wonderful beast. You know, they, you chase a, a marsh rabbit and it jumps in the water and swims away. Okay, but those, the Spartina is quite edible and, and one of the main herbivores is the snail, um, the marsh periwinkle. And, and this is, now you should be drawing, right? There, I'm laying on too much information now. You need to start get capturing some of this. So here's this uh, marsh periwinkle um, eating the uh, uh, epidermis off the, um, uh, the cordgrass leaves, leaving a slime trail, which is what snails do, right, that fertilizes um, fungi and bacteria that the snail goes back and eats. So this is the farming snail. It's farming with its own mucal trail. <coughs> and per marsh periwinkles can decimate a, an area of Spartina, um, which then gets recolonized by, by um, black needle rush. Um, but 
Um, marsh periwinkles are also very tasty, and they're um, fed on, I believe, by, by blue crabs, um, by um, terrapin, diamondback terrapin, um, which are having trouble because they get caught in nets, which is sad, what a beautiful beast, and by red drum. Um, and, and these are feeding on each other as well, and then there are blue crab fishermen out there, crab trapping, um, taking out the, um, the blue crabs, which then allows a proliferation of, of the snails, which then they can mow down the, um, the, the smooth cord grass. All right. All right. So, that's enough. I've been talking too much. Sorry about that. I, I want now you to start, I'm not going to do anything to get you going on this, but I'm, I'm hoping you will. Um, I want you to start with two boxes. And I'm going to continue to yak uh, intermittently, but I want you to have two boxes. You can hold the paper long ways um, and have a box for uh, coastal forest and have a box for salt marsh. And, and I've suggested some mechanisms that would drive that. The obvious one being sea level rise. So, you know, you'll have an arrow coming in from outside, <coughs> an arrow connecting the two boxes, and then arrow coming in from outside, that sea level rise, that's going to, maybe you connect that to the arrow that's causing the transition between the two. This is funny. With your pencils on the paper now, get them out, get writing, get drawing, do it on your arm if you don't have paper, it's fine. Criticize your neighbors. Um, let's get some models going. Okay, so we're starting with a simple model with two boxes. Coastal forest and salt marsh. And we have one driver that we've brought in, which is an arrow coming from outside, which is sea level rise. And it's going to, we're going to have one direction in this model that's going to be from coastal forest to, um, to salt marsh. Yeah, like that. That's what I'm talking about. We need some pens or pencils. Is there some writing implements? Yep, here they come. We've got some. We've got a pen. Oh, Joe's found them. Okay. We have some pens coming here. Go for it. So we have, okay. Yeah, that's what I mean. Okay, so now we have, let's, we have an arrow here that's going from coastal forest to salt marsh. So I would go the other direction. And, and then I'd bring in the sea level rise as driving that process more quickly um, between the two. But, wait, sea level rise is not a gradual process, as you know. You know, it's something that's episodic. So where are you going to put hurricanes in this? Is, are hurricanes going to be one of those processes that keep salt marsh as salt marsh and coastal forest as coastal forest, or is our hurricanes going to drive this process of coastal forest transitioning into salt marsh? Stasis or change from a hurricane? Okay. There. 
Okay, now most of you have the two boxes and you have coastal forest transitioning into, into salt marsh and you have an arrow coming down towards the arrow, the transition arrow, indicating that sea level rise is accelerating that transition. And then some have another arrow, which is the hurricane arrow, um, which is also driving that transition. Because in my experience, when a hurricane hits a salt marsh, after the hurricane, it's still a salt marsh. The, the, the rush might be lay down and the grasses may lay down, but they pop back up and you don't get a change. But if the forest gets knocked down, then it's often, it's obviously very much slower to regenerate. Now, we know from global change models, climate change models, all of them have predicted that the intensity of hurricanes is going to increase which makes sense because with global warming you have higher sea surface temperatures and sea surface temperatures influence the intensity of hurricanes. So we can be assured that over in the future we're going to have more intense hurricanes. On the issue of are we going to have more hurricanes, that's where the models tend to diverge. Many of them say, yes, the frequency of hurricanes is going to increase, but others say, no, that the frequency is going to decline. The decline in the frequency of hurricanes has something to do with um, shear at high elevation that, um, oh, it's so obvious how that works. If you have any trouble, ask Todd Osborne. He's one of the scientists here. He can explain it to you because I can't. I'm um, sorry. Um, but so we do have more, at least more intense hurricanes. And with more intense hurricanes, that's going to help drive this process of coastal forests giving rise to salt marsh. Now, there's, we also know from the climate change models that droughts are going to get more severe and more frequent. Well, wait, why is he bringing up droughts in, in this case? Well, we talked about sea surge increasing with, with sea level, that the, how far the surge penetrates is, an influence, is influenced by how high is the sea at the time the surge happens. With increments in sea level, surges are going to go farther. It's a multiplicative phenomenon. So if you have an inch in, in increase in sea level, you might have 10 feet of increase in the surge and how far it goes. Now, if you have a surge, even with low salinity water, <coughs> the area where I work, it's only about 18 parts per thousand out in the Gulf because of the Swanee effect. Out here in the ocean, it's 32, 33, something like that. So it's low salinity. So you get a surge of low salinity water, but oh, if it's followed by a drought, what's the salinity of the water in the soil the next day? 20, no, not 20, you, 20, no, come on, do it right, 19 the next day, okay, you were fine, you were averaging, uh, 19 point something, and, and the next day, it's 25, the next day, it's hot, sunny, the trees are transpiring, sucking water out of the soil, the, the water is evaporating from the soil, and the water in the soil that started at a measly 18 parts per thousand is now after two weeks at what, 45? Okay, 45. I'm not sure exactly what it is. It's something like that. Um, and then it's going to go up to 75. And when it gets past 10, there are no trees here that can stand it. And they die. So you need, drought, you need a drought arrow driving this process. Okay. okay, what else do we have going on? What are these other phenomena that are influencing just... Well, let's say the stability of this or, or the stability of these two ecosystems, the, the coastal hammock and the salt marsh. Well, you have cabbage palms that are reproducing that are pretty tolerant of salt. Um, if the seeds are being dispersed around by, um, by raccoons and by bears and so forth, and they're getting 
they're germinating, they're escaping the beetles because they, their effect on the gastrointestinal processes of the bears and the raccoons or otherwise, then you're going to get reproduction of the cabbage ponds. And what we see actually is this coastal forest um, starts out with 25 species of canopy trees. Along the coast, there are only two, cabbage palms and red cedar. But they're happy. They're doing well for a while um, while there's a lot of light because the oaks and the elms and the ashes have all died. There's plenty more opportunities for them to, to reproduce. Okay? So you get a proliferation of cabbage palms and red cedars along the coast. Okay, what else? What have we missed in this, in this effort? Let me take a look at these processes that I specified. Well, we have the internal drivers of salinity and salt tolerance, and tolerance of flooding, we have herbivory and seed predation. Then we have global warming and sea surge and storm surges and hurricanes. Oh, rack, that weird word, W-R-A-C-K. That means the... The, the dead vegetation that's floating around and settling on the standing vegetation and smothering it. And that can be a place where you get proliferation of new species that colonize um, and, and into that area. If you have any freshwater withdrawal from the aquifer, then this process is going to go faster because the trees are drawing water often from depth if the water recharge is, is blocked by pumping, for example, for agriculture or for municipal use, then this recharge water that's feeding the roots of some of these trees anyway um, is going to be depleted, and they're going to be dependent on surface water, which has higher salinities. Okay? Well, you know, you're doing okay. Some of you are a little reluctant when it comes to modeling, but I... I think most of you are getting the idea, but let me throw two wrenches into the works. Um, the first wrench is this familiar wrench, um, the Brazilian pepper. And, and this is one that has not been investigated yet. How, how does Brazilian pepper influence the transition between coastal forest and salt marsh? I mean, you get it around here, right? And it invades, and, and I've done some work on, on the biomechanics of Brazilian, Brazilian pepper. And it's an amazing species because it can grow as a tree, it can grow as a shrub, multiple stemmed, and it can grow as a liana, um, a vine, using neighboring trees for support. So you'll, if you go out and you watch, there's a, there's a red cedar with, a, with a, um, a, a Brazilian pepper popping up right through it. It's used the red cedar for support to get above it and then shade it out. And it will also do that with cabbage palms. And it's, it's a change in the allocation of material for height growth and diameter growth. Um, in this study, we looked at the mechanical properties of the wood of Brazilian pepper, and the wood doesn't change, just the shape of the plant changes. And if you ask me later, um, I can explain how my, um, my son, who's now a freshman um, in college, his first appearance in a, in a scientific publication was his buttocks were mentioned in this study of, of biomechanics. Oh, I'll tell you. We, we needed, um, we we're down in Flagler Beach, and we had all these samples of wood, and we needed something that was rounded and weighed about 20 pounds that we could put on the samples to measure deflection. And we tried, you know, weights and stones and buckets of water. And, and then somebody espied young Antonio, who was only a year old at the time. He was a fat little kid and uh, very happy to be placed on these samples. And we measured the deflection. So <laughs> I had to explain that, right, in the paper. What else am I going to do? So Brazilian pepper comes in. And this is an amazing species. It's, it's more tolerant of salt than cabbage palm or red cedar. You've seen that, I think. It's less tolerant of salt than black mangrove. Um, but what's it doing in, when it invades where, there with the, um, cabbage palm, or the cabbage palms and the red cedars? Well, I always think about it as shading. 
But what's it doing below ground? This thing is transpiring. It's using a lot of water. And when it takes up water from the soil, it doesn't take up salt water. It takes up fresh water. It filters out the salt. It leaves the salt behind. And the leaf area has substantially increased because of the presence of Brazilian pepper. And I think, I don't know, Todd, what you think, um, that it's concentrating the salt in the, in the soil and driving this process even faster. Woo! Model that. Let's measure it first. Somebody needs to do this, this science. Um, but I think it would be real interesting because this thing comes in, you know just how dense it gets. And the other ringer for me is a native species. It's black mangrove. Um, and it, as you know, is spreading northwards. Um, it spreads um, by these little propagules that are all over the beach. Um, the, oh, and, you know, I taught you about diarrhea. Now I want to provide you with a um, financial opportunity. I'm starting a company um, to make these into olives. Because in Bangladesh, they eat these. Um, and, you know, they treat them like olives with lemon juice. And I haven't made them into food yet um, or anything that even my son would eat. Um, but I'm, I'm close to it. And I think if I had some investors behind me, they're just judging from how many black mangrove propagules there are. Um, but when, you in, when black mangrove comes in, it's coming in often on the edge of the coastal forest and out in the marsh, but it seems to me it's really dense where it gets trapped up there right on the interface between the cabbage ponds and red cedar and the salt marsh and the iva, the, the salt marsh shrubs, it gets trapped. And, and there's another player here that we need to keep in mind, it's these sesarmid crabs. So when you're modeling this, and you get home and you, you, know, you get released and you wanna draw this thing, you need to include these guys because they're voracious predators on black mangrove propagules, the little things that float around, and they also eat black mangrove seedlings. So you can have a million of these things. I mean, I have um, a handful here. Um, these would all be eaten by the crabs, but where are the crabs? And is the places, are the places where black mangroves take over, are they where they're not crabs or they've just been completely inundated with propagules and, and even the crabs couldn't eat them all. I don't know, but um, as I just think if we can, I mean an olive when it falls from the tree you can't eat either, right? Um, they're nasty, um, but okay, so think about that um, in terms of investment opportunities. And with that investment opportunity, I'll close. Thank you. <laughs>